Cafe. And uh, we have some of our elders here uh, with us, hopefully a couple on the way. We had some people run into some crises this week. We couldn't get here. Uh, well, why don't you just introduce yourselves and uh, tell a little bit about um, your experience with the Heart Defense Cafe. Ben, go start. My name is Patrick Haney. I've been here for quite some time now. I enjoy everything that I do. Especially working with people, working with Bob and Gretchen. And I have like a lot family working together. Thank you. started right after I got out of jail and been there doing my best. I'm an elder now. I'm assistant uh, food co-op coordinator and a partner and housing coordinator. I uh, volunteer whenever they need somebody. They call me. I come to help them. Hi, my name is Wayne Potter. Uh, we've been going hard time for a uh, year, month, somewhere else. Uh, hard times means everything to us, because that's the only thing we got. Because my education ain't that much. But, uh, but the hard times are only I love it. Mary 
individual waters, and um, I direct a national program for uh, World Vision called Love for Children that brings uh, local churches alongside uh, low-income children at risk and their families in collaboration with Head Start. Empowerment is the big issue here. I, I attended your, your uh, workshop in the Grand Rapids, and um, I, I see us as, as heading firmly down the wrong path. Um, and I want to get us back into the, the corner of, of not service provision, but empowerment. And, and I think you can help, help me, help my teams to do that. Um, my name is Tina Cosmo. I'm the administrative coordinator for Hard Times Cafe. Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming. I've been uh, administrative coordinator since February of this year, and this is the second, excuse me, the third conference I've put on um, with the help of Hard Times Cafe patrons and staff. Um, Hard Times Cafe is what I consider the most um, up-to-date program. When I first came to Hard Times Cafe, I had had jobs before. Um, some very well paying, but I didn't have the self-confidence to consider myself um, majorly employable. Thanks to Hard Times Cafe, I decided that I can um, support my family, and I am working toward that right now. I'm Kim Verhelle. I am a volunteer for Hard Times Cafe, and I am the coordinator coach. And um, we have several coordinators in our program that they um, they oversee different aspects of the the Hard Times Cafe, like fundraising coordinators and record keeping coordinators, and there's just a whole slew of them. And um, it's my job to meet with them each week to um, just guide them and see how they're doing in their jobs and to help them to get some. Um, leadership skills and management skills and then I do an evaluation on each of them um, and there's another volunteer that helps too but he couldn't make it today. Um, <coughs> basically that's what I do. My, my name is uh, Michael Stoops. I'm the uh, community organizer with uh, another national group, the National Coalition for the Homeless. I've been working with homeless people for over 20 years. Uh, I'm originally from Indiana. I'm on my way to go see my parents, and I was just realizing I have not been home on Halloween for, since I was a little kid. Uh, so I'm looking forward to being on Halloween to see if people still knock on my parents' door seeking help. I, I did not dress up as a kid as either OJ or Nicole. I, I remember I dressed up as a dressing up as a hobo. Some of the older folks remember this. I even dressed up as a girl one time when I was in the fifth grade. So it's a pleasure to be here. I do a lot of work with uh, organizing homeless people all around the country. And I, and I agree with my World Vision counterpart in power. I think we're, we, the social workers, have failed to end homelessness. I think we need to be about building a movement that's to be led by poor people. To find out more about our times. Okay. We have a lot of um, experts in this room. We have our elders and patrons mm -hmm. who are really experts in terms of what it's like to go through hard times, and I think most of us know that from our own experience. But in many ways, experience is a much better teacher than any course that you can take, or any book that you can read, or any conference that you can attend. Uh, we can learn from that and we can get our feet on the ground through experience and, and integrate what we're learning and, and, and turn it into something that happens and, and moves and progresses and improves. Um, and we're fortunate that we've got a small group in some ways um, because it really allows us to share our experiences and to kind of put our heads together. And we have a model that we want to share with you and some some basic principles and structure on, on exactly what we believe empowerment is and how to do it and how not to do it in a sense. Um, but I think for this to be really helpful, 
it will need to be integrated with all of our experiences. And that's why we have a panel of elders up here who can, as we go through each section, they're going to be commenting on, on what this has meant to them um, on both sides in terms of when these principles or steps were missing and when they were there, the difference of that meant. But also, if, if you could uh, offer your insights or suggestions at any point, and don't hesitate to, to interrupt me. If I'm in the middle of saying something, someone should remember it. Someone doesn't remember it, but it could have been that important anyway. Okay, so please interrupt if you have a comment or a question to clarify. Um, we are taping this. We're hoping to be able to uh, have these tapes edited so that we can provide this training to other people without having to go around and do it, although because we are in real limited time frames. We don't have like, 13 hours a week, basically, to, to operate to, you know, in my role as facilitator and to do the training and to monitor counties and things that want help in this. So we're trying to figure out some efficient ways that we can out. So if there are some things that you don't want taped, uh, please jot it down and we'll make sure it gets edited out. Okay? <laughs> and we will, you can hold us to that and make sure that that doesn't get, get shared because there's going to be a, you know, we're taping the whole two days so there's no way someone's going to watch the whole thing. It won't be edited. Uh, so feel free, don't let the tape hold you back. Feel free to share whatever you like and feel free to, to really question our thinking and our ideas and things like that, uh, because that helps to sharpen it, that helps to, to clarify it. So I think the, the easiest thing is to think you know what you're doing. And ultimately, I think that's also one of the most dangerous things. If you think you've got it all figured out, you're probably in trouble. Uh, because then you're living in the past. You're not dealing with what's in front of you right now and what's coming down the road. And that's our challenge, is to always be in the moment and deal with what's happening and to anticipate what's, what's going to happen. Um, let me give you just a brief picture of the Hard Times Cafe. A lot of you are familiar with this, but let me just fill you in. Um, we opened um, almost exactly three years ago, in November of 1991, shortly after uh, Michigan cut off general assistance. And uh, we sent out a flyer to uh, everyone who had lost their assistance and simply asked them to come for a, a meal and a meeting. And uh, uh, the original intent was to, to set up a support group and. Um, it's nice to have a couple of people from ACT teams here because uh, part of the thinking when I was originally starting this was the Fairweather program where they take people out of institutions and create lodges and things like that. We never got into the group process or just never seemed to fit and wound up going in a different direction. But really that was in many ways the basis for what we started with. Um, and. Um, we set some, uh, some pr pretty basic and simple goals uh, in the first few weeks. Uh, basic, I think you all have copies of that, uh, to uh, improve uh, each person, so that each person is focused on improving themselves to develop the skills and capabilities, uh, to help people to, to keep moving, uh, to create opportunities for people so that they can improve, so that they can get in going in a direction that's going to get a feel right to them and provide some momentum for them. Uh, to change the community's perceptions of disadvantaged people. Uh, and I think if we were to do a survey of our patrons, that would probably be the most important goal. Uh, because people feel like second class citizens. You stand in line with your food stamps, and there's somebody going to be scowling at you, or everyone pretty much is going to be looking at what you've got with their money as kind of that you get. And, and so the Hard Times Cafe has worked really hard to change uh, people's minds about that, change their perceptions, and to improve the community. So so not to so much just to take what we can get, but also to give something back and to, to show what potential we all have by going out in the community and making some visible changes. And that fits right in with the, with the third goal. And then another goal that was, um, that was added a few months later um, Proposed by a patron who was leaving the state and got a job, and we were reviewing our goals at the time, and he said, Well, this is something else you do, you might as well just include it. Uh, and that's to become a positive role model for children. Uh, we have a children's program called Fun with Friends Cafe that was started um, about two years ago, and uh, it was done informally for quite a while, and now it's pretty much a formal program where the kids make the decisions and they have their own alternative economy, just like we do, they call it Fun Times Dollars. So those are the, the basic direction that was set for the program early on. 
uh, the first rule that was established was that all decisions are made on Thursday nights. We meet Thursdays at 4.30 at St. Athanasius Church in Harrison, and all decisions are made at that time, and they're made by consensus. Everyone has to agree, okay? One person can stop the process, uh, and any one person can delay the process. If someone needs more time to think about it, it happened last week, there were some proposals, Wayne brought up a subject and there was a lot of discussion about it. He had a proposal and then there were two or three kind of amendments to his proposal and we dealt with one of those and there were a couple left and then we were getting to Dwayne's main proposal and someone said, I need more time to think about it. So we're not gonna vote on it that night, okay? Anyone can delay that process, any one person, okay? So that they have a, a sense of control about that. The other thing that does is it challenges people to develop their thinking, planning, and organizing skills. And that's one thing that I noticed in working uh, uh, as a counselor with Community Mental Health uh, with a lot of disadvantaged people who didn't have regular employment or any kind of a regular structure for their lives. There was no incentive to use your mind, no incentive to plan ahead. Uh, you didn't have any resources to work with anyway, so uh, the, the time frame tends to get shorter and shorter and you think in terms of right now, or this afternoon, or today, rather than next week, next month, five years down the road. Um, and that's a, that's a real kind of a split sometimes, because especially those of us who've been to college, um, you know, we've put off things for many years. I mean, it's been seven years at Michigan State, so you learn to delay things. But when you don't have the resources to do that, the gratification comes closer and closer, and it really sets you up for substance abuse because you can feel good for a little while right now. Uh, and it, it puts people, I think, at risk for that. So in the process of, of um, going through these meetings, everyone is challenged to think and to listen and to think and, and to sort things out. And the consensus process really forces that. Uh, you have to, to pay attention because sometimes we have two very different ideas about what, how to deal with something or how to come up with something and we just keep on sorting it out. Uh, and many other times, one person says, no, I don't like this, this isn't a good idea, and it winds, winds up getting refined. Something better comes out of it. And they, they, they listen to what this one person is objecting to, take that in, and we come up with a better proposal than what we had to begin with. Uh, Pat has turned into one of our, our best uh, compromisers in the, the situations I can remember where we had the, the biggest difficulty making a decision, where there were just two wide groups that couldn't agree. Um, Pat has a tendency to just kind of sit back and take it all in and then come up with this beautiful, simple compromise that meets everyone's needs. Uh, and Pat is, I'm sure you don't mind sharing this because we talked about it before, um, he has told me that he has trouble learning. And in the first meetings, he didn't want to say anything at all. He used to come up to me and say, well, why don't you say this or why don't you suggest this? And I'd say, well, Pat, you say it. And we also have an incentive system. We have points, uh, which we now call them points of improvement because people got confused about it, but we originally called them hard times dollars. We changed the name because people were confusing them with real money. Um, but they earn a hard times dollar every time they contribute. Every time they do something helpful in the meeting, they earn a hard times dollar right on the spot. Okay? So it took a few weeks, and Pat finally spoke up, and people recognized what he had to say and listened, and then he came up with these just amazingly beautiful compromises. I'd really like to see him get into the legislature. <laughs> sorting things out, listening to real needs and coming up with simple but, but concrete solutions. Um, <clears throat> we opened a store early on where people can exchange their hard times dollars for things that they can't buy with um, food stamps, uh, things like toothpaste, toilet paper, uh, laundry soap, shampoo, um, all of those things. Uh, in the first meetings, I talked to Gretchen because there was an odor to the room with all of the, the people there and I was saying, what can we do about this? Can we set something up so people can take showers or maybe the schools will let us use their <coughs> showers or something like that. And she said, it's not showers they need, it's laundry soap. And they lost the general assistance, food stamps, won't buy laundry soap, they can't buy laundry soap. Imagine not having any laundry soap. You can't wash your, your clothes. Um, so we made sure that laundry soap was available in the store, and that's one of the hottest items every time. And when we helped uh, another program open up in Dow Creek, we 
suggesting that a store the first time you go on or so because what people really want for it. It's, it's, it's just a real simple, basic thing that, that we take for granted unless we don't have it. Uh, so paying attention to those simple things and giving people the opportunity to earn that, uh, I think is a real important part of, of, of what we built into the Mark Times campaign. Uh, we also set up a uh, community service work system uh, where patrons, uh, we have about half a dozen work sites now. Um, we work at the, the Road Commission, uh, Bernie uh, pretty much manages the animal shelter. Uh, we work at the Michigan Community Action Agency where they have a sewing room and a loom room and we help them in their, in their warehouse with food distribution and things like that. We work at a YMCA camp, at a Girl Scout camp, at a used clothing store, and the Department of Social Services in, in Gretchen's office and volunteer for her. Gretchen had a meeting to go to. I would like you to meet her. She'll be back either today or tomorrow. So you chance. She's a volunteer coordinator and, and basically one of the, the co-founders of, of the Hard Times Cafe. Um, one of the things, and we'll get this handout for you tomorrow. I don't think we brought handouts for our principals. I forgot to ask them to do that, but I'll we'll bring some tomorrow. Um, one of the things that we did pretty early and we spent a number of meetings talking about was establishing some basic principles that we were going to live by, that we're going to guide us. Yes? On the top of your steps. No, I meant the, the, the 12 oh, principles. Okay. Yeah, these are the principles yeah. of empowerment, but the principles for the Hard Times mm -hmm. Campaign. Um, we should have memorized by now, but there's honesty and follow through and endurance and there's a, a list of them that we go through, but basically that's what we focus on, okay? And whenever there's a conflict, we can go back to those principles. So we kind of laid a foundation for what's important to us, what's going to guide us, what's going to help us keep moving when we get stuck. Um, and spent quite a bit of time doing that. Um, in, we started the community service work in February of 92, about three months after we opened. And we set up a system in Hard Times Dollars where they're paid according to the work habits that they've shown during the day. Because one of the problems is if you've been out of work for a long time, you don't have established work habits. And you're not used to getting up and being there at a certain time, and you're not used to paying attention to how you're dressed or, or a lot of other things. You're not used to working throughout the whole day. It takes a while to get, to get those habits established again. So what worked out was that um, they earn hard times dollars for each work habit that they show throughout the whole day. So if they show up early, they get 50 cents an hour for the whole day. If they work at a steady pace all day, they get another 50 cents an hour. Okay? Yeah? You should, you should um, clarify that this is not 50 cents U.S. dollars. This, right. is, this is half a point of improvement. Half a point of improvement or 50 cents in hard times dollars. That's what I'm talking about. There is no, there's no cash here. We don't have much cash. Um, so in hard times dollars, thank you, Tina. They earn half a point, or points of improvement. I'm still not used to using that term. They earn half a point, yes? I just have a question. Um, you know, is this, do you have like a job coach there to monitor this? Or? Each of the agencies um, where we send people has someone there who does the rating <coughs> each day. Then. Okay, so they have a, a coach there. Uh, so we would like to have our own coaches, but we just don't have the, the staff for it. So are these places in the community, say, well, no, we only do it for um, for nonprofit organizations, for service agencies. Um, I think we'd be in big trouble if we tried it with a business because basically they would be paying less than minimum wage. Um, the way it works out, you know, with our funding, um, they can earn up to. Um, there's 12 points on the rating scale, and so they can earn up to six hard times dollars an hour, uh, and limit the work to two days per week. Although many do more than that on a volunteer basis. Um, just because we don't have the funds to cover it. Uh, so they can earn 96 hard times dollars a week. And then we calculate an exchange rate um, based on how much money we have available and how many hard times dollars or points of improvement have been earned but not yet spent. And so we just take the pot of money, the, the amount of money we have in our checking account, divide it in two so we always have enough to keep going, and then divide that into the total amount of <coughs> points of improvement that haven't been spent yet. And that gives us an exchange rate. It's been as high as 13 to 1. It's been as low as 3 to 1. And it fluctuates just depending on, on uh, where our income is. We get uh, grants from Campaign for Human Development and from uh, uh, 
two or three churches, and then we do fundraisers that the patrons coordinate. And at the end of this week, uh, we're doing a, um, right here, we're having a haunted house. Uh, the patrons have been working on for quite a number of months. Last year, we did the same thing. We had 250 kids come through, and it's a really exciting thing. Yes? Uh, yes, we, we get some help from United where we did last year. We were still working on our 501c3, so we're not sure how it's going to work this year for that. But we get some, some help from United Way, too. Um, and then we have some other things that we do. Um, and so they can use the, um, the uh, hard times dollars they earn or points of improvement they earn doing community service work for vouchers. Okay? And they can get vouchers for necessities, um, things like... Um, Transportation, rent, house payments, taxes, clothes, food, medical needs. Uh, think of any necessity, and most likely a patron has thought of it and proposed it and got it approved. Uh, now, everything that I'm explaining to you had to go through that process. Okay, that it had to be um, voted on at the floor, and it had to be unanimous. Okay, everyone had to agree, so it was discussed and looked at. There are a number of things that weren't voted on that were turned out. Um, and sometimes they change their mind. The first time that um, someone suggested haircuts, uh, it didn't pass. Uh, people said, there were two or three patrons who said, well, we can get haircuts, so we'll just do it on a barter system. And then um, all about a year later, someone brought it up again and made a real good case saying, hey, if you're going to go for a job, you really need to have a haircut. You need to look good. So that passed. Tina. Um. I think it's important to, to let these people know that we have evolved. Um, in the beginning when it first started and we were trying to decide on what to spend our, our points on, um, the basics, um, clothing, rent, um, gas for your car to get back and forth to where you have to go, was the most important things. People thought that haircuts um, was frivolous um, next to where you're going to be living tomorrow or or you know how are we going to survive? Um, now we have evolved. Some of our more basic needs have been met, and we're thinking now about things like getting jobs and being presentable when we go to interviews. So the haircuts have evolved out of our new needs. How our how our needs now are based rather than what they were based on when we first started. And we have a we have a system so that uh, you know we guarantee that the vouchers can't be turned into cash because we get a lot of personal donations. So we have a, a system that's like a traveler's check where we sign it and they sign it again when they get to the store. And basically, we sent a check uh, the next day to whatever if it's a gas station or a store or something like that. We send them a check. So hey, they have their cash ahead of time. So it's really easy to sign up businesses to, to accept our vouchers. And of course, we ask them to make donations at some the same, the same time. Or that's what we're doing. And the way we do it also doesn't hurt their um, ABC if they get ABC because they don't actually see the money. Yeah. Um, they don't count as income. Yeah. ABC or SSI doesn't count towards their grants, so there's no um, risk in terms of losing income by looking for hard times dollars. Uh, after we were open for um, six months, um, we appointed uh, a group of elders uh, and basically just went through the list and chose the people who had been to the most meetings and then started having elections uh, after that to replace elders. And then when we set up our bylaws, they decided they wanted elders to serve a one-year term. And we have elections uh, four, or three times a year, and we have a total of nine elders. And it's set up so there have to be four men, four women, and one that can, can be either way, so everyone feels that they're, they're represented. Uh, and the same thing, the elders' elections are uh, by consensus. We take any nominations that people want, we vote on them all and just keep eliminating the one with the lowest total until there's one person left, and then they have to vote one more time to, to agree on that. So it has to be a, a consensus system. Um, and then about uh, a year and a half ago, we, uh, we started our coordinator um, program. Um, and we could have started that much sooner if we thought of it. Um, the direction and I were constantly trying to recruit more volunteers and get more help to, to deal with things, and finally, the obvious thing came, you know, came into our awareness that the thing is, like, have the patrons do it and ask them to do it. And it was interesting. We had uh, two work sites at that time, and I was having a really hard time keeping up with them and, and you know, staying in touch with the supervisors and, and just no time at all to develop new work sites. And uh, the first position we hired was for a work site coordinator, 
and within a month we had six work sites. And they were all working in the number of hours of uh, community service work just went up and up and up from that point on. Um, and you could hear different types of work experiences so people could try out different things and, and can adjust things so that people who have disabilities can, uh, can work within their limitations. So you know, people who can't get up and move around very much uh, so they're, you know, they're like just a couple of people doing sewing or operating a little bit, don't have to do much movement. We have a man who has a, a heart condition and he's not supposed to work at all, but he feels like he wants to do something. So he answers the phone at the animal shelter you know, a couple hours a week and he has to And it helps out there because it frees up other people to, to, to do their other work and things like that. Um, and now we have, we have 24, 25 coordinators keep on coming up with different coordinators. Every time there's something else someone wants to do, uh, the elders hire a coordinator to, uh, to set it up. So we have a jobs coordinator who searches jobs in the five county area and posts them every week and keeps it all updated and, and uh, helps people with resumes and, and connects them with the agency that, that, that can do job readiness training and things like that. And she has a venture program where patrons who have found jobs work with people who want to find jobs and, and things like that. Um, Tina is our administrative coordinator. She um, just handles a ton of administrative tasks. Um, we don't know where we would be if we had Tina for the last, uh, the last year almost. Um, we have um, records coordinator who keeps all of our minutes and our history. We have uh, um, a housing coordinator that's looking at uh, keeping a list of all of the available housing in the county and making arrangements with landlords so that people can, uh, can find a place to live quickly. And we're even trying to work out a guarantee system because a lot of landlords are hesitant to, to rent to low income people because they're afraid the place is gonna get trashed or something. One bad experience sets up a whole bunch of landlords for, for a long time. So we're trying to work out a thing where we can provide a guarantee that if, if the house isn't in a good enough condition when someone moves out, our patrons will go in and take care of it so that we can make it more likely for people to get housing. So all of these coordinators um, pretty much are working uh, on their own much of the time. They meet with Kim on a regular basis, and she's our coach. And she helps them to, uh, to, to set priorities for each week and to keep focused, and then she does their rating. And the, the coordinators are rated on a 16-point scale, so they can earn up to eight points of improvement per hour. And they're rated um, according to their management and organizational skills. Okay. Um, and it's pretty hard to get the full eight points. Um, they, um, we look at the eight points, the definition of that is if you were in a job doing this and doing a good job, that would be the top rating. Um, so each of those criteria, so that the coordinators generally earn between six and eight uh, uh, points of improvement or hard times dollars per hour, but it, it really helps them to develop those skills. And one of the problems with coordinators is they keep on turning over because they get jobs. They just need someone who's doing really well in a position and then they're going to move on pretty soon. So it's a continuing uh, process of, of training, um, training the coordinators. And then the coordinator team has, um, has administrative responsibility for the program. So they, they have their own budget now and they uh, make decisions on how to spend that fundraising events and things like that to do and, and, uh, and all of those things. Just recently, uh, this summer, we started our partners program. Uh, we have three partners at this time. Uh, partners are focusing on outreach to the community and they're working on starting a business. And our goal is by the end of the year, um, the end of the fiscal year, so by next September, to have a business in place that will hire patrons and where um, partners can earn their salary back, anything that they earn, and also will help to, to fund our voucher system, okay, so that we can become self-sufficient and not be so dependent on grants and, and donations and things like that. Any questions on? Yes. You said none of this affects the SSI? Right, right. We checked that out very early. Um, so it's all in points, and they never see any cash, and the, it's impossible to, to really, not impossible, but very difficult to turn it into cash. Uh, to turn the vouchers into cash. Are most of the consumers on SSI? Um, right now, an increasing percentage. We have, uh, I would guess, probably 60% um, at this time 
Part of that is because we've had a number of people move on during the summer. We had 20 some people with jobs in June and July. And so a higher percentage of the people on SSI, it's very difficult to take a job because of the way it's structured. You can lose your SSI if you take any kind of job, even if it's just a test out to see if you can do something. It's just real hard to get back in it. It's a real risk. Um, so we're in a, in a process of doing some outreach uh, to, to bring in more people and, and uh, talking to more ADC recipients. And so our numbers are getting back up again. We were averaging about 100 people per meeting um, through most of last year. And at the end of the summer, it was getting down, went down to 57 uh, at one meeting. And now we're back up into the 70s and 80s again. We're doing outreach. So the, the people, the new people who come on who have disabilities, tend to stay longer, whereas other people move through other like jobs. And, and quite a number of people who have jobs continue to come back and, and help with the program and support other people, but others, you know, just get out with their lives. Probably the majority of the time their lives. Yes? You mentioned your meeting is in Harrison. Yeah. Um, you know, where we live, most of our resources are pretty far and few between. How do you get people to this meeting? Uh, we have volunteer drivers um, who call Gretchen is volunteer coordinator for DSS, handles that. Uh, so we have volunteer drivers who go out and pick them up. We have call. And, uh, we try to get anyone there who could, who's interested in coming. Did you know that? We also have a transit system here. Um, so um, the transit <coughs> system could people out, pick them up, and bring them to the meetings. And usually if they can get to the meetings, we get them home. Okay. Um, we, we, um, some of us will, will go out of our way to take people home to the meetings. We're very, um, we, we're very problem solving. When it, I mean, if somebody, uh, we have five people right now that are in Claire, and we have somebody who lives in Gladwell, and you're talking like two ends of your county, and he takes them home to Claire every night, and then he goes home himself, just because they want to come to the meeting, and they want to get home. So we, we pretty much come into a, a problem solving abilities and I mean, just by asking, you know, who's going in that direction. Um, how many do you actually have on the staff? Uh, two. Just two. Two. Well, Gretchen uh, um, is volunteer coordinator for DSS and I started out with five hours a week. I worked for Kenton Family Service and I started out this uh, five hours a week and then about uh, ten months later uh, they increased that to seven hours a week. And then last, uh, then their funding, they weren't able to fund it anymore after the end of March of this year. Uh, April, there was no funding for my position. And then in May, um, uh, the Admission Community Action Agency contracted for 13 hours of my time. So right now I have 13 hours a week. Their funding ran out at the end of September. Um, basically, this, these conferences are what pays my salary. So we've got a much larger turnout. I think having it two days, was, that was the suggestion that everybody made at the last conference was to have two days, but then and seeing the turnout, I think it's a lot harder for people to get away for two days, plus it's more expensive. So um, we're going to be doing more of these to, to bring in the funding. So right now, Hard Times Cafe and contracts with Captain Family Service for 13 hours a week. So you're not actually state, you're not county? No. Okay. I don't know. Hard to believe it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we have some, uh, quite a core of volunteers. We've had probably, by now, 90 different volunteers, uh, most of whom work in the kitchen uh, and prepare the meal. And we were getting by on our meal until we got some funding for that. We were getting by on our meal for an average of 30 cents a meal for a couple of years. People, you know, really scrounging to get donations. And, and it was one, the first winter we had a lot of deer meat. We were getting roadkill. That was being donated and very creative cooks who were turning it into really delicious meals, but people were getting a little tired of deer. We have a, um, a volunteer who's been with us from the very beginning who uh, um, uh, keeps track of a lot of our hard times dollar system and, and tracks you know, every, every time someone makes a comment at a meeting. And it's a helpful comment there on our time dollars, and he keeps track of all of that. Kim, of course, is our, our real important volunteer in terms of our coordinator coach uh, and keeping in contact with the coordinator. 
We have another volunteer who works with Kim First year it was easier. Um, we got more donations the first year than we have since then. Um, the problem I think is Clare County is just basically a low income community. Seventy third or something like that out of eighty six counties and somewhere up there in terms of income levels. So that there's just not a lot of money here to do that. Most of it comes from churches and, and some local businesses and you know, something like that. But it's hard to keep going back and asking again and again. And, again. Uh, and we just, at this point, you know, really haven't developed a real good uh, fundraising system, primarily for lack of time. We have fundraising coordinators, and they do they do um, car washes and like the haunted house, and they do bake sales. And they they sell hot dogs at the fairgrounds, different groups are renting the fairgrounds and things like that. Uh, so we bring in some money that way. We don't have a, a fundraising chairperson that you know, does six donations from the community. That's part of what our partners are hoping to do. They're just getting established, but to reach out to the community and, and get people more involved. Tina? Um, I think we should mention that um, selling the hot dogs and doing the car washes, last, <clears throat> excuse me, last year we brought in a little over 12000 so we sold a lot of hot dogs. <laughs> so if you think about what's happening here in terms of people's commitment to what they're doing, they're going out to the fairgrounds and selling hot dogs um, as a volunteer thing so that they can put the money in the voucher fund and then earn it back at a six to one exchange rate, maybe a dollar an hour by doing community service work. Okay? So there's a level of commitment here that, uh, that is really impressive to me. People are really enthused about being able to have some control on the lines and to, to move in that direction. Because that's what the fund is. Yes? That's one of the things that the partners are looking at. We're trying to, we're looking at the whole range of types of businesses and things like that. Um, there was just some discussion about that. Dwayne brought that up uh, at our last meeting to even set up an exchange system uh, where people can do a Christmas gifts and things like that. We do have an exchange coordinator who helps people to barter, and so people can exchange hard times dollars between themselves and, and do work for each other and things like that. Uh, the hard times that they see, you see this as a, as a substitute for the general assistance program, and does the community see the hard times to pay as, you know, as a new GA system during the state of Michigan? I guess we see it as an alternative to welfare in general. Um, we started out with GA, but I would say that uh, we've got quite a number of people who've been on uh, ADC, uh, you know, who have children, uh, quite a number of people on SSI. Uh, so there's a lot of people who were never on GA who have come through the program. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Anybody help me on that in terms of how the community see us as a as a different form of GA? Well, I'm hoping that they see it as people trying to help themselves better themselves so they don't have to rely on, on assistance. I mean, that's what the whole idea is, is yeah. to train us for going out into the community to work. Yeah. And we try to do some real visible things, like we have a community beautification coordinator. Um, and the last two years, we've had greenhouse space donated to us, so we've planted uh, 70 some flats of flowers uh, around public land in each of the cities in Clare County. And last year we worked with the Chamber of Commerce and planted flowers all the way along the roadside in, in Harrison. And we also planted um, 11 million wildflower seeds on the highway media on US 27. And we planted uh, hundreds of trees along the fence 
who are there, those won't come, won't be visible for quite some time. Um, but they're there, and you know, we have a sign that we have to get out the highway space so people can see that and recognize it. And it's hard to hold on to your perception, you know, when you say people don't want to work or people are just lazy or they're living off the system, when you see them doing that and you see those kinds of improvements in the community. So that's, that's an important thing. I work at the uh, down here at Box of Humanity. And I used to work at a factory that closed down, stamp out steel. Well, I worked just as hard where I, at that place, I did it there. So you ain't getting no free military if you're working for it. What are you working for? And the feedback we've gotten, many of our, our work sites also mm -hmm. accept community service work from the jail and, and people from most programs and things like that through DSS who are forced to go and work. And the people at the work sites have told us there's just no comparison between the work they're getting from part-time cafe workers and the people who are forced to, forced to work uh, by the government for one reason or another. But just the quality of work and the enthusiasm of the community is, is very important. One other thing I, I want to mention is, is we have a um, portfolio system. We keep a record of uh, clearance. Our one clearance didn't make it today. Clarence, our, our volunteer who keeps a lot of our hard times things, keeps records of everyone's work history. And if someone goes for a job interview, they can get their complete portfolio and their entire work history to take with them. And if you can imagine if you've been out of work for quite a number of years, uh, if you get into a cycle where it's self-fulfilling. You can't find a job because you haven't had a job. And people want to know, well, how did you spend this time and what did you do? Well, I look for work. That doesn't go over real well in an interview. But you can bring them the actual forms and say, this is the, these are the work habits I showed over the last few months, and this is what you can expect from me. Uh, and we've had a number of employers who now call us when they want uh, workers. So they don't even place ads, they just say, you know, need two people, and we'll send four over for interviews. And, and hire two. Yeah. Um, that doesn't work just for, for jobs. Um, I'm applying to the social work program at, at um, Saginaw Valley State University, and Part of the requirement in order to get into the social work program down there is that I must have worked and um, volunteered or, or participated in a related field for so many hours, 1,500 hours or whatever. And with them keeping track of the hours that I've worked both at the Department of Social Services and as Administrative Coordinator for Hard Times, that fulfills my my requirements. And it also looks good on the on the application when you say that you have been an administrative coordinator for a community organization. So it, it helps us in, in a lot of ways to, um, to do what we need to do to get on with our lives. Okay, any other questions? Of course, you're all welcome to come and visit the Hard Times Cafe tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we're closing here at 2 o'clock, and then we serve dinner at 4.30. The elders meet uh, at 2.30. To plan the agenda. That's, I didn't explain what the elders do. They basically plan the agenda for the meeting and they deal with any problem situations if there's a conflict or something like that. Uh, they'll try to get to the bottom of it and clarify everybody's concerns. And uh, they also um, hire the coordinators and supervise the coordinators in the sense to deal with the concerns there. Any other questions about hard times? Can I follow up with Michael's question again and Jason's? a lot of time outside of the state of Michigan, I know. Um, and with the with the GA population, I think it's saying, you know, what the big mystery in Michigan has been what you know, what happened to that population. I think, you know, there is no, unless they've gotten on some other um, form of, you know, disability or the state, the state doesn't have a disability program that they picked up about 12,000. I think we just read the other day, like 83,000 people were affected by the, the cutoff of GA. But, you know, the mystery is, you know, of those folks, and what you were saying is hard times. Um, cafe doesn't provide an income that replaces GA necessarily. You know, so. Yeah, in terms of, and that's that's unfortunate. I wish we had the funding where we could do that. I wish we had the funding so that our exchange rate could keep people at minimum wage for time. But I mean, if you're earning 96 hard times dollars a week, and the exchange rate is 61, you can't really live that. Now it's down around four to one. We don't claim to be an income subsidy or, or a way for people to supplement their incomes. We just, we're real clear about that because so if some of those folks are out there, they're basically having to stay with somebody else or whatever, yeah. or the bulk of their income, yeah. Yeah, they can still qualify for food stamps. But yeah, yeah. scratch by or however they can. I think that's basically what the conclusion is, what happened to the yeah. folks are out there. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. 
it's been primarily word of mouth um, until recently. We just came up with that brochure last month, and those are going out to doctor's offices and mental health and community action agencies and, and different places like that. And we've also had patrons in the waiting room at uh, DSS who hand those out and personally invite people to come. In the last two months, AP workers have been suggesting this to some of their um, some of their clients. Um, if they if they're coming in for emergency heat help or something, um, they will suggest that maybe maybe they'd like to visit us to see if see what they can do about helping themselves. Um, a lot of the, when they were doing social contracts at DSS, there was somebody at the social contract meetings talking to people that were there, inviting them to come to our meetings. Um, Letting it be known that it wasn't mandatory, but that you know we'd like to see them there. They'd be welcome to come. Okay. Um, really, the focus for this conference isn't so much the Hard Times Cafe as it is the, the process of empowerment and what that really means and, and how to do it. And that's that's really what we want to get into. But we wanted to kind of give you a sense of, of where a lot of this um, came from. Uh, this basic model is how we're going to spend uh, most of our time dealing with what's on this one page of which you all have with your, your, your handouts. Um, it's basically, I've, I've worked uh, in a number of different settings. I've worked in institutions with uh, uh, mentally retarded and chronically mentally ill people. Um, i worked as an outpatient therapist uh, to an individual family and counseling, do a lot of work with stress and anxiety and things like that, and have worked uh, quite a bit with disadvantaged populations. And from my experience, this is basically what was there when things worked, when I felt that people were becoming empowered and people were getting on their, their feet and taking care of themselves. And what I'm also noticing is this is what was missing when it didn't work that there was one or more components of that missing. So it's kind of a, a summation of, of uh, my experience in working with, uh, with disadvantaged people and also from the experience in working with the Hard Times Cafe. Um, I'll give you an overview of that, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go into in, in, in more detail each one of those steps and do some reflection on that and look how you can integrate it into, into your work. Um, there's four basic principles that we uh, that we started with, with the Hard Times Cafe. Uh, four things that uh, that we feel are, are the essential components of empowerment. And the first one is the dignity of each person. That you focus on their dignity. You focus on the part of, of themselves that you know has something worthwhile and something positive and something that can grow and develop. Uh, dignity is something we're born with. Okay, it's not something that you have to earn, or not something you have to to pay for, or not something you can you can get by doing something. It's just something inherent in every person. And when we're treated with that sense of dignity, then we can be fully human. And when we lose that dignity, we become something less than human. So that's that's the, the bottom line. The first the first meeting we had, and and even now, uh, especially with new people, uh, we had six people at the door shaking everyone's hand when they walked in. So everyone got their hand shaken at least four or five times. And we had tables set up nicely. We had snacks set out. We served them coffee. People don't stand in line at the Hard Times Cafe. We serve the meals to them. We have volunteers serving at the beginning. Now our elders do the serving. Uh, because the elders' job is not so much as a leader, but as a servant. To serve the patrons, to listen to them, and to represent them so that their thoughts and needs and ideas get out on the floor. Uh, when they set the agenda. Um, I might also add, just in the structure of the Hard Times Cafe, uh, once, a, once a month we have an open meeting. The elders set the agenda for each meeting uh, regularly. And then once a month we have an open meeting, and that means whoever's got the floor has the floor until they're done talking, and whoever gets their hand up next has got the floor next. And they can make a proposal, they can make a comment, they can make a complaint, they can make a suggestion. It's just totally open. Every other meeting, uh, the elders set the agenda just because with so many people, uh, it's too easy to get scattered and all over the place. So they listen to the patrons, and then they prioritize the discussion items, one, two, three, four, five, and we talk about number one first, number two second, and just keep on going. And there's always you know, one that's not looking at each time. Okay. But 
that dignity is the essential component, I think, the one most important aspect of the Hard Times Cafe, that everyone um, is born with that. And it, it's something that's realized in community with other people. You can't have a sense of dignity all by yourself. It's realized with other people, but something that's, that's within ourselves. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about each one of these, but I just want to give you an overview right now. The second is the potential for improvement. We focus on people's potential rather than on their deficits. There's no screening criteria. We don't ask what's wrong in your life. We don't ask you to prove how bad off you are. We focus on what can you do? What are you interested in? And that everyone can improve. Um, the third is the power of community. That by coming together, we're much bigger than the sum of all of us as individuals. So by working together, we can make things happen. And that anything significant happens in community. And there's nothing really significant that happens in isolation. Even, even an artist who, who makes some, some beautiful creation um, has no meaning until people and the community experiences that creation. And so anything meaningful happens in community. And then the fourth is the need for responsibility that people need to have a sense that they're responsible for themselves and it matters what they're doing, that, that it's up to them, that it's not someone else making decisions and they're going through the steps, but it, it's, it's up to them how it happens. Okay? And then there's four sets of steps. Okay? And these are essentially the supportive blocks for this foundation. Okay? They're the, there's what holds it up. There's the conditions for improvement, the process of improvement, the role of helpers, and the process of becoming an effective helper. <coughs> and the way this is organized is the bottom step is the most critical. Just like if you're walking up some stairs, okay, and you take away the bottom step, it's a lot harder to get up. Okay, And the other steps aren't supported as well. So if people don't have control, it's a very significant condition. Okay, If they don't have that control, it's hard to get anything else going. And that's that's the bottom line for the Hard Times Cafe is to make it absolutely clear that people have control of the process. Um, like I said, any one person can delay the process or, or deny a proposal. And we did have one person who was voting against every single proposal just because she was angry about something, so we modified that. So one person uh, can stop the process um, or delay it, put it off to another meeting, but if only one person votes no, they need to tell us why they're voting no and make a counter proposal. And if they don't do that, then the, then the proposal passes. But two people can block it, one person can delay it. And we always ask at this point, um, who's against it first? Okay, we have a discussion about the proposal and then we ask, is there anyone opposed to this? Okay, so that it isn't, you know, you don't have all the hands but two go up and then people are afraid to to speak out, so you have your chance to impose it first, okay? So each step builds on the other, okay? If you try to give people responsibility without any of these other steps, uh, it's difficult. It's not the same thing as blaming them ahead of time for failure. They don't have any sense of control. If they don't feel accepted, there's no basic support. There's no real opportunity that they see um, and no incentive. Just saying you're responsible for this is blaming them. So in each one of these, the role of helpers, each step builds on the other one. Okay? And we use this as a screen for any of our activities. Okay? So if we want to do something, does it fit with these principles? Does it fit with these basic concepts and these steps? And if it doesn't, then we need to look at it again. Okay? Now the other handout you have, um, is uh, the ABCs of working with disadvantaged people. And in a sense, that tries to summarize all of this in another way. Okay? And I'll go into that in more detail too. But essentially, any time that you're looking at a, at a difficult situation or figuring out how to help someone to, to uh, empower themselves, think ABC. Accept, balance, and clarify. And that will help to keep you moving. That will help keep you going in the right direction. And what I'd like to do is to try to apply some of those ABCs um, over the next few days to your situations. Okay, so I've got a person in this situation. How can we deal with it? Accept, balance, clarify. Okay, I'll spend more time uh, going into exactly what that is. 
Are there any questions just about kind of the overview of how this works, how these steps fit together? Everybody clear on, on that? Okay. Um, myself as much as I 
been teaching stress management and talk about the principle of balance that I'll get into, but I got overworked and was pulling back and try to sort things out, and Pat was recognizing the effect that was having on the program, and called the meeting of the elders where they did an evaluation of me and, and what I needed to do to improve how I was working with the program. So there's never a, there's never a time where we've got it all together and everything is just perfect, and if we ever get to that time, then we're probably having some kind of a delusion or something, because it's, we're living, we're working with a real world, and, and that changes, and we don't have this down in terms of doing it every day exactly as the model says um, that it works, but we, we keep on working with that as our direction, and, and use this sheet and these steps, the steps as our guide, and if things aren't going well, we can look at this, we can look at those steps and figure out where where we need to make some corrections and what's going on. So that's that's the value of, of having that model. Um, Roxy said something that I thought of it as she said it, and then and then someone else mentioned it too. Uh, she said she was just a patron because the other patrons up here are elders, and an elder asked Roxy to, to sit in for her. Um, and actually, our organizational chart has the patrons as the top organizational chart is a circle. And so the patron is the most important person on the chart. Everything starts and ends with the patrons, okay? And we have elders, and we have coordinators, and we have workers, okay? But everything goes, so the elders might set the agenda, but the patrons make the decision. Okay, the coordinators may plan a fundraising event, the patrons make the decision whether to go ahead with it or, or how to do it. There's a coordinator team down here, I won't go into full detail. But our organizational chart is a circle. There's no, there's no person who has something above anyone else. It's all patrons at the top. At the center. Yes. And you have the staff group? Yeah, the staff are pretty much out here as advisors. Okay? I have no authority whatsoever with the Hard Times campaign. Okay, I, I don't make any decisions uh, that aren't, that I'm not authorized to make by the patrons, and any decision I make can be overturned by the patrons. We also have a board of trustees that has the legal authority for a program for the corporation, Hard Times Cafe Incorporated. It's made up of the nine elders, and then uh, we have space for up to nine members of the community. Right now we have six. Uh, any of those decisions, according to our bylaws, can be overturned by the patrons. So the patrons have total control of the program. <coughs> yes? Do you see patrons as exchange for purchasing? Yes. Oh. yes. Um, we don't like to use the word client. And we don't yeah. like to use the word recipient because it implies that, that there's an unequal relationship. And I'm helping my clients. I'm, you know, they're dependent on me in a sense. The feeling that this patron is just someone who comes um, we just came up with Patreon and it's stuck. So um, we try to keep um, our language as simple as possible. I've got one of the elders keeps notes whenever I say a word that she says is too big. She writes it down and tells me about it. So it's helpful to keep the language, you know, in a way that everyone can understand because that's a way to undermine someone's dignity if you start using language that they're not familiar with, they're not comfortable with. Um, you know, I know the feeling I get when I hear something on a radio show or a news show where they use a word, it's like, well, what's that word? And, and I've lost the next three or four sentences of what they said because I'm trying to figure out what this word means, and, and it, it just can stop the process. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, a bilingual uh, situation ever developed? Do you have participants or patients um, that, that are, for example, Spanish-speaking? We've had uh, maybe three or four Hispanic members, and I think two black patrons. Uh, but Clare County is primarily. Uh, okay. But they spoke English. They were yeah, they never had okay. any problems with language or anything like that. Okay. Um, any other questions? I was in South Carolina last Friday. Talking with a group of social workers about how to end homelessness in South Carolina, very even more conservative than Governor Inouye's Michigan. But uh, 
people down there were, I, I believe that the way to solve poverty is through housing and jobs. But some of the, my social work friends were saying that we needed to pray for people, which we do, of course. Uh, but we need to teach people values. We need to teach people responsibility. My philosophical question to you and to the panel of elders, where does the, where does the, the right to employment, where does the right to welfare, where does the right to housing fit in into empowerment? It seems like if we stress accountability, the responsibility of people that help themselves, that they also have rights to entitlement. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think that in terms of, of um, system changes and, and things like that, um, we're per been primarily focused on day-to-day on -day struggles and reality and how to deal with that. But as Tina said with the haircuts, Okay, there is a there is a change, and there is more of a of an interest in that. And um, particularly as as other counties are looking at starting at similar programs, um, we've talked a number of times at meetings that, that there's a potential to become a political force. Uh, at this point, we don't have much. I mean, we're struggling to survive month by month ourselves, um, and focusing on taking care of that. So in terms of, of um, changing the system, the only thing that we're doing is trying to offer an alternative and a model that can hopefully influence some people and, and make some changes. Um, I can't think of anything. We have, we've stood up to some landlords and things like that. We've had some landlords that have really been taking advantage of some of our people and, and stood up to that, um, you know, kind of a nuts and bolts issue. Tina? Um, well, I don't know if this um, will answer your question. But in the Hard Times Cafe, we have taken the homeless um, situation of Hard Times Cafe into our own hands. There have been several of our patrons who have um, been homeless. Um, they came in homeless. They moved into the county, had no place to go. They've lost their homes. We've had several burnouts in the last couple months. Um, instead of trying to go through um, individual government agencies or going through private agencies, we've taken the homeless issue into our own hands and offered them our homes until they can find someplace else. We've pulled together. Um, we've had several patrons who, who have said, stood up and said, look, um, I have a balloon payment coming up on my house, or I, you know, something happened and I can't afford my house payment this month. I'm going to lose my house. What can I do? And we pass the paper around, and everybody donates money to help raise the payment. Um, that's empowerment. That's giving us the, the means and the right to, to solve our own problems the best way we can. And I think that's the best thing that um, empowering people can do is um, teaching them to solve their own problems because there isn't always going to be a government agency there to fall back on. Or there isn't, you know, um, places like United Way and, and some of the other places, they run out of funds quickly. There's always somebody in need. And if we count on them to pull us out, um, they're not always going to be there. Their funds aren't going to be there. We have to learn to do it together. And I, and I guess I think I guess we're looking at showing people. I keep my <laughs> um, just to clarify something that Tina said, uh, the paper that's passed around to the donate, on, uh, we're donating our points of improvement, not any monies that we have in our pocket uh, to help the ones that need the help. Um, and now I lost my train of thought. I don't know what the other point was. I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> When and I know that you, you were also mentioning uh, other organizations that can help, but a lot of the people, including us, don't know of, other, of any place else to go for help. There are a lot of programs available uh, to those that need things, but we don't know where to go. Uh, and being with Hard Times, we've learned of a lot of, of organizations that could help us in other ways. Back into, do they come back and return? Many of them do, yeah. Yeah, yeah we have one.
one guy who uh, was out of work, I think, for six or seven years and um, was doing community service work and they hired him part-time and then they hired him full-time at the place where he was doing the, the work for part-times and then he uh, went and got a contractor's license and now he's working as a contractor and he's hired two or three patrons himself um, in his job. So there's, there's a number that continue to, to come back um, and, and try to balance it you know, with their own families and things like that. Um, that gentleman has also helped in other ways. Um, he donates a lot of his time and energy. He, um, he has a truck and he allows us to use the truck for home. Like um, the haunted house, we're going to need to haul things here for the haunted house. Um, he donates a lot of his time and energies into helping us out physically also. You know, helping us set up tables for the meeting or helping us tear down tables or helping us by loaning us the truck. Um, he's helped several, several of our patrons move. Um, just whatever he can do, you know, he still participates quite, quite a bit. That was a decision that was, as I think, was actually formally made because one of the things that one patron brought up real early in the program, especially people on GA, because a lot of people with evictions and, and uh, shut off notices and, and losing their house. They had a half a dozen people whose houses were saved through hard times through their work. And, we had lengthy discussions and set up a separate committee on how to help people when they get an eviction and a shutoff. What can we do? Uh, it could clean out our whole bank account to, to set that aside and how do we decide who to help and who not to help and, and things like that, especially at that point. And what, what came out of it was just this very simple solution, um, which happens so often with our patrons, is that you take this complicated progress, problem and they come up with a very simple, clear solution. Somebody says it needs help, they'll just ask for it, and we'll transfer our times dollars to them so they get enough to get by. And it has never happened in three years of the program where I've announced at a meeting that someone has a shutoff notice or an eviction notice that by the end of the meeting they haven't had enough hard times dollars to get a voucher to take care of them. It's never happened. And most of the time, they don't know where it all came from. People, it isn't like, well, I'll give you you know, 50 hard times dollars, you've got to pay me back by next week and, and things like that. Um, it's just an incredibly generous group and they know when they're in need that they're going to get their needs met too. So it's really a process of, of pulling together and not so much looking for outside help as trying to do it ourselves in terms of, of like we're trying to start our own business to create jobs in Clare County rather than doing any kind of political thing or anything. There just aren't many jobs in Clare County. Of where we are, so we're trying to do it ourselves rather than trying to depend on someone. And I, and I think from that position, we come from a position of strength, and that fits with the empowerment model because you can get a mindset of being dependent. And we could say Clare County is one of the poorest counties in the state. We have the highest incidence of, of child sexual abuse in the state. Um, we have over one third of our children in poverty, second in the state in terms of number of children in poverty, under six. We could say we need lots of help. And you get to see yourself as being dependent and as, as needing outside intervention. You become dependent on that intervention. So what we're trying to do is saying, how can we help ourselves? What are our strengths that we can build on? And we'll take whatever help and support we can get from that, but let's do it from our own feet on the ground and building up step by step there. Um, and that's essentially what we're talking about with the with the empowerment perspective versus the service perspective. Were there some questions that I missed? Yes. Do you have any native people that come to the campaign? Um, native American? Uh, I can think of uh, four or five. They, they come here and there. Um, we've had a couple that have come, gotten jobs in the state. Um, we've had um, two homeless people that, that came in here with natives. Um, found housing with our patrons and then also moved on. Um, we have so many people, so much, we have so much of a turnover. They come, they, they get the, the help they need and then they move on. It's, it's hard to say that we have steady patrons. But See, we don't keep a lot of statistics either. I mean, we give people's name, address, and phone number, and that's about it. 
they fill out a, they started having them fill out a form that's separate where they don't put their name on with some of that information so we can get some of that. But we don't ask people what their income level is, what their nationality is. We don't have any screening criteria. Our focus is on helping them to feel accepted and welcome and there's no qualifications that they have to have in order to be there except for one of them. Um, yes? I guess I can say something because uh, I know a lot of uh, our people will get, you know, get eviction notices all the time. And, uh, I mean, that's a great deal of money. And we're talking about several people at one time. So I guess what I'm wondering is how is obtaining these hard time dollars in exchange for vouchers? I, I guess I'm understanding the vouchers are like to get, you know, laundry sold or to get... Your basic that's our store. Oh, we, have, okay. we have a store where people, where items are donated from the community, and that's where we get the laundry soap, and they just spend their hard times dollars like they would at any other store. But the vouchers, our annual budget has been about uh, twenty-two to twenty-four thousand dollars a year, and that totally goes for vouchers. Okay. Where is that money coming from? Grants? That comes from grants and donations. Oh, okay. that's that's we don't have an operating budget at all. Just this year, the coordinators um, started setting aside 10% of the fundraisers that the patrons do, so if they do a car wash or something like that, 10% of that goes to the coordinator fund for their administrative costs for like, you know, they're doing this um, haunted house and they need some money to buy paint and things like that. So that we just started that six months ago. But our entire budget goes for vouchers. Everything else is in kind donations for our space and, and salaries. Um, I want to outline some of the differences because most of us are, are trained in a service perspective and we're trained that helping people is a good thing. And I'm not saying that helping people is a bad thing, um, but there can be a situation where helping long term can do more harm than it does good. I mean, because you can create that sense of, of dependency and that sense of that you have a right to, to be given something and it tends to diminish oneself, one senses himself. I know that um, uh, I used to work for the state of Michigan and I thought I had a totally secure job the rest of my life. The facility closed and I got laid off and uh, it took me six months to find another job and I had an opportunity to get a part-time job that would have paid me just about exactly the same as I was wearing, uh, working on unemployment and I just, no way. I'm entitled to this. I gave six years of my life to the state of Michigan they threw me out. I'm entitled to this unemployment, and, and actually the job I got wound up falling through, and I lost my house and everything else with it. But if I had taken this part-time job, it would have had some security, and I could have built from there. Uh, but that sense of that I was entitled to that unemployment because I put in all that time uh, really burned me, and it cost me uh, to do that. So I think any time that you just give someone something, in a sense, you also diminish them unless there's something within the relationship that changes that. Okay? And I think that's the essence, and that's what I really want to focus on the rest of the day, is the relationship. And empowerment is basically a difference in how we relate to people. Okay? And we have systems and structures and things like that, and, and the Hard Times Cafe is, is um, <coughs> structured so the patrons have total control and they make all the decisions, but it has to happen in the context of relationships. And I know during the month of September when I was under more stress than I've been for a long time and the funding is uncertain, and when we get under stress, we have a tendency to push. And so people have been telling me that I've been too controlling this time, that I'm trying to make things happen and not stepping back and being receptive and listening and taking that into account. So we have the model and every one patron can stop the process or change the system or, or work within it. But if that doesn't happen in the context of the day-to-day -day relationships, it falls apart. And even if you have a structure that is extremely rigid and you have to treat people a certain way and they have to fill out these forms and do all of this, the relationship that you establish with that person is what makes a difference whether it can be empowering or not. And that's, that's, I think, for us the bottom line is how to relate. And that's a constant, ongoing process of trying to improve that and understand that. So I want to just give some a list of differences between a, a perspective or a way of looking at things from serving people or helping people versus empowering people. 
And the definition of to empowerment is very simple. I got a journal article that had a half a dozen different real complicated definitions on what it means to empower people. But the simplest thing is just to go to the dictionary. And to empower means to give authority. As simple as that, to give authority. So when you empower someone, you give them authority, which means you let go of authority, which means that you're on an equal plane, that you have no authority over them, they have authority over themselves. Okay. Now, in terms of our training, and I'm not saying it's necessarily bad to, to provide services. People need services, and, and that's kind of a state of the art in many respects. But I'm saying that empowerment is inevitably going to be better. Empowerment means people are going to need less services in the future. Okay? And a lot of our training in a service perspective focuses on why. We want to get down to the causes. What's, what's, what's making this happen? What's driving it? Okay, we're always debating in Congress whether we deal with causes of poverty or, or, you know, and that can be an open-ended thing. Why is a question that you can just go on forever and ever, okay? But when you're really working on empowering someone, you ask how. What are your, what are your obstacles, okay? Not what are the causes, but what are the obstacles? Okay. What are the obstacles to helping you get moving right now or to or to to becoming more effective or making improvement? What's getting in your way? Okay. Rather than causes which are thought of many times in terms of deficits and, and, and what's wrong and that sort of thing. Okay? So we ask how rather than why. Why tends to get you stuck. And when you ask someone why, it has a it has just kind of a of a feel about it. You know, like if I just say to you, if I can pick up, why did you scratch your head? Okay. It is. Okay. <laughs> but did you feel a little bit defensive? Sure. Yeah. That question yeah. brings on that feeling. Okay. It makes you feel a little bit defensive. Why did you do that? It's like you have to explain yourself. Okay. But when you look at how, then it changes how you see things. Okay. And that's another underlying thing that we're going to be talking about the next two days is how we see things. Okay. And it's a real basic part of the steps in terms of the process of improvement. But we need to change. How we look at things, how we view things, it can make all the difference in the world, and I'll, I'll go into that in a lot more detail. Um, the service perspective is research-based. Okay, they always try to look at. Uh, I got a, a thing from an organization that's doing some planning here, and they're, they're, one of the steps was you ask the experts what to do. Okay, and we're always looking at research and, and, and working with um, with mental retarded people. Uh, I worked with people where it was always necessary to look at the research, and I wanted to find out how to deal with things. And I worked with one man in particular um, who had a, he came to us from another institution, um, and he had a, a big almost hole in the top of his head where he was continually hitting it up against the wall or a door, or, or he hit it up against like the side of a window or a door, or even on a doorknob and things like that. And it was, it was continually oozing. I mean, it just never healed because he was always hitting it. And he was an extremely strong and powerful uh, young man. He was in his 30s, he wasn't that young. But um, one day he um, climbed a three-story building, a brick building, with his fingers and toes, barefoot. And he just climbed straight up the wall, just like a spider. He was so intense, OK? And when he came in, I mean, the whole place just, just kind of shuddered, OK? Because he was just, I mean, they took nine guys once to hold him down, and they weren't doing a very good job, two on each leg and each arm and one leg his head. And he still was getting away. And I looked back and through his chart, and there was all kinds of research stuff. Okay? And they tried to reinforce him for not hitting him. They, they just quoted articles and they changed how often they would give him MMs when he didn't hit himself. And, and all kinds of stuff on research, and none of it had worked. What I did was hang out with him, which was what I found out worked and with this population and works with everyone. I, work with is simply to spend some time to get a sense of what his experience was and for me to experience who he was and what was going on. And it didn't take more than a few days to notice a pattern. He hit his head on doors and windows. On the, he hit him on the side of the, the windows and at, on the actual door. That's where, he hit his, that's where he hit his head almost all the time. Okay, And that's when he would start to go crazy was when he was at a door. Okay. So I simply opened the door, and this was a locked unit because there were a lot of violent people on it, so you couldn't you know, just come and go as you pleased. Um, 
So I just took him to the door, opened the door, and he was blind, he couldn't see, but I let him feel what was on the other side of the door, and then took him back through, and he no longer hit his head on my door. And I did the same thing with the windows, let him feel the window, and then took him around the outside, let him feel the outside of the windows, took him through every door in the building, went through the janitor's closet, the whole thing, let him experience every door, and he stopped hitting his head. That can only come out of experience with one person. He somehow had built this incredible frustration. Who knows why or where in his history, and it didn't matter, that somehow doors were threatening to him, or not knowing what was on the other side of the door was difficult for him. Okay? But once he had a sense of what was on the other side of the door, he was okay with it. There was no problem. Okay? So it's focusing on not what the expert tells us, but what our own experience tells us. Okay? and what we see and hear and feel and sense from being with another person. Okay? So instead of experts saying, this is how it's done, we're co-learners. Okay? If I didn't have someone like Pat calling me when I'm starting to, to move in a different direction from where the elders want to go with, we could get messed up real fast. Okay? We both have to be learning. Okay? There are no experts, and as soon as we start to think we're an expert, then we're causing some trouble then we're missing something. Now, we may have been an expert in the past, but this situation right here is unique and different. And this person right now is unique and different. Okay? We're taught to have a fixed perspective. Okay? This is the way it is. This is what I learned in school. This is how to do it. Okay? Instead of an expanding perspective, to see things in a broader sense, to see things, to see things in a larger context. Okay? And to be able to then bring that in and look at real narrow concepts and what's fitting together or working or not working and changing perspective instead of just saying, this is how to do things and this is just the categories that we need to put people in. We always hear about needs assessment. Anytime any program wants to start, the first thing we do is a needs assessment. Okay? It tries to look at what people need and if we meet their needs, we've got to make okay? a simple um, formula in a sense. Instead of a needs assessment in terms of focusing on deficits and problems, we do a listening survey. Okay, and, and I've had a difficult time. It's interesting, patrons can do listening surveys very well. Our elders are experts at it, okay, to listen to what's going on with the patrons and, and happening. But whenever I've had graduate students come in or interns or something like that, and I ask them to do a listening survey, they don't get it. They want to structure it, they want to listen to questions, and, and they want to. Uh, to, to keep track of every response. And I said, no, no, no. Don't come in with any questions. Come in with one question, but listen to the person and then follow up. Ask your questions based on what they say, just to clarify and get to the bottom of it. So you hear what people are saying rather than hearing what you want to hear within your format. Okay, now that blows it apart in terms of research because you can't really quantify that or it's not clean and simple and neat and things like that. But the bottom line is human relationships aren't clean and simple and neat. Messy with that. Okay? Knowledge versus understanding. You could have read every book in the world on social work and psychology and not have any ability to help someone to improve themselves or to empower. That information is worthless until you can understand the person that's right next to you or across from you or, or the person that you're working with. Okay? Um, instead of a client, they're a participant. Okay, so it breaks down an ego relationship. Uh, instead of a recipient, they're a partner. Instead of a subordinate, they're an equal. Okay? And all of those terms we just use again and again and again. Okay? I mean, I do counseling one day a week, and I talk about my clients. Okay? And it just becomes part of the mindset. But that sets up an uneven and unequal relationship, and it diminishes the sense of equality. Focus on deficits versus focus on strengths. Um, Tia mentioned a homeless family that showed up, uh, it's been over a year now, but they uh, they came from Alabama, I think it was, and just wound up in Clark County, and someone said go to the Hard Times Cafe, so they showed up at the Hard Times Cafe, and some of our patrons put them up for the night. But I asked the guy, um, not what's going on, how did you wind up? you know, not having a home and having your four kids sleeping in a van and things like that, I asked him, what are you really interested in? If I could give you any job and I could take care of all of the arrangements, let's just say I had all kinds of resources and everything I needed and I could just create any job for you down the road, what job would that be? 
and he said, computers. I've always just been really interested in computers, but I don't even have a high school diploma. There's no way I could do anything with computers. Well, we have a computer coordinator in our Times Cafe. And this guy was hired as computer coordinator, and he took the manuals home and read them and figured them out, and wound up going back and getting his high school diploma, and then went on to college, and now he's in his third semester of college, and he has a straight four point average. And he got a job tutoring other people, teaching them how to use their computers. Yeah. He's now going for chemical technician for Dow. He should be able to get his job by the end of May. Really? And it's be and because of his, his knowledge of computers and there. Yeah. I was just talking to him two well, days ago. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Henry's going to try to be here, but he's working and going to school full time. It's a busy time for him. But that's the difference in terms of focusing on strengths. Okay. This is just an interesting ad. So, not Services, we talk about modifying behavior. There's even a whole theory of, of intervention called behavior modification, okay? Instead of developing our own natural gifts. And everyone has a gift. Everyone has something that they have to, con to contribute to the, to the rest of us. Everyone has something, and many times they're very well hidden. To the extent that we've been hurt or diminished or anything like that, those gifts become come hidden, and sometimes we really have to search for, them, search for them. When we try to modify someone's behavior, that gives them a sense that they don't have any control or influence about themselves. It's not up to them. We try to change the individual versus building community. Just about every program that you can think of uh, focuses on individual changes. All the Department of Social Services programs and the health programs, it's all individual cases. They're easier to keep track of. Okay, you can count them, you can measure them, you can do all kinds of things there. But what works is to build community, because when you've got people together, you've got a sense of support, you've got a sense of togetherness, and, and something that, that you can fall back on. But when you're just out by yourself, it can be real isolated. And I think that's one of the, the, the worst parts about poverty in this country, at least, is the isolation. People in poverty are isolated. People who have disadvantages are isolated from other people. There's not a sense of, of being in a community, and we are social people. Yes? Well, you know, at, at home, we really have a lot of people that do not trust each other. I mean, uh, you know, uh, these people have done so many things to each other. I mean, you know, just because of the community, and they're all out for survival. I don't know how you can develop that sense of trust. Because if you're coming together, and you're saying, look, we're a community here, it doesn't Um, you take the time and you let go of the mistrust. Okay, you let go of the past. Okay, you let go of what's happened that someone doesn't trust another person. You don't focus on that. So you don't focus on, on the deficits, wherever this was. Um, you don't focus on the deficits. You focus on the strengths and how you can help people to build that. Okay? And you provide experiences where they can work together and where that, where that builds. Okay, so, um... I guess I don't know how you can do that unless you trust each other. I mean, see, I think that has to be a point where all of us trust what you're saying, might be valid, at least might, and to give them a chance to work on it. But if you don't even have a sense of trust, I'm not so sure how you can even tell them to their strengths or... It starts, it starts by trusting each individual. Right, that's what I'm saying. They yeah. don't well, if the by the staff, person. by the staff, and the people in the program trusting them. Okay, so it's easier now because we have this atmosphere in the Hard Times Cafe where people do trust each other and pull together. Right. So some would come in and hook on right away. But in the beginning, it started with everyone consciously deciding to trust. Trust is ultimately a decision. Right. Okay, so you decide to trust someone even though you know they've burned you in the past or that they've taken advantage of situations in the past. Okay. We've had people that have come in front of the elders um, because they've lied about something or tried to get a voucher that they didn't deserve. You know, like we have a one-to-one -one exchange rate for gas uh, for driving to work sites, but they have to carpool. So this person lied about that. Okay, that was dealt with and that's done. There's another situation where you have to trust his word. We choose to trust his word. Okay, we will take the consequence, the consequence of trusting and having him 
not tell the truth is is less than not trusting him to be given. That's worse. Okay. So we make the decision to trust, and you give people a level, and this will become clearer when we talk about um, the conditions and the process of improvement. You give them a level of responsibility they can handle that matches their needs, and you give them a challenge that matches their needs, and you trust that they're going to follow through on it. Okay? So it's establishing that personal relationship. It could be staff to patron, but it also then becomes patron to patron, okay, where they start to trust each other. Okay, okay, that's a good point. Uh, we'll bring those in tomorrow so that you each can have a copy of that. But we spent a lot of time talking about how can we make this work. Okay, I mean, when we first opened, we had nothing. Okay? We had no income, we had nothing, no support or anything. So what do we need to make it work together? And they came up with this list of 12 principles. This is what we need. And we spent a lot of time at the meetings talking about those principles and what they meant. And, and patrons were given awards for demonstrating those principles. You know, people who were showing us through experience that they understood and were living that principle. Um, and doing a lot of problem solving and dealing with things. Uh, and a lot, another part of it to build the trust is to, to be very upfront with everything. So, um, and something that I think um, that I've done many times, but early on, I just made a stupid mistake. I don't remember what it was, but I remember one of the patrons calling me on it with great pleasure. Okay, ah, I got you. Okay, and the only thing to do in that situation is, you're right, I do it, thanks. I try not to make that mistake again. But to be, and that's another one of the steps, is you have to be humble have to decide to trust people and to deal with conflicts as they come up. So if there's an argument between two people during a meeting, we stop the meeting and we work it out. Okay? So that you're always focused on that dignity, you're focused on the potential. I want two things to keep my mind to, to point to these. You focus on that we're building something bigger than any one of us, that no one person is bigger than the Hard Times Cafe. Every person is important but the whole is bigger than any individual person and that everyone is responsible for the whole program. So you just keep that focus and the trust grows. Um, just like the support grows. And it's not something that we, we um, have a training session how to trust each other, but in the process of working through an empowerment process and building community, that trust grows and develops, just like the support group. Yes? Do you have any substance Well, they can't abuse the system because they have to work for their vouchers. Uh, we have had you know, people who abuse substances. Um, we don't ask them. Okay, we, we, um, we deal with behavior. If someone is acting out and shouting or screaming, we're going to deal with the shouting and screaming. And we're not going to ask, why are you shouting and screaming because you're drunk or because you're high or something like that. We don't, you know, I've smelled alcohol in people's breath and I've seen people that I've guessed, you know, maybe have smoked marijuana or something like that. Uh, but I don't even bring it up. Um, so they can come like the first day before the day or they'd be intoxicated and Right. As long as their behavior is appropriate. Now if they're falling down drunk, they're gonna be asked to leave because they're falling down. Okay? Not because they're drunk. And there's been a side effect. I had a guy that I didn't even know was an alcoholic who told me that he had been, he's been coming for almost three years from the beginning, and he told me last spring that he had been dry for six months. And he just made a decision to do it, to come and cure there. So we don't, we never focus on a deficit and say, this is what's wrong with you. We'll focus with, with the behavior. Okay? Now, in one-to-one, -one, I might talk with someone about that, um, but I think it sets them up. Okay? Uh, whenever that's happened, if I ask, you know, have you been drinking, the tendency is to get defensive and to not admit it anyway. So the clearest thing is to deal with behavior. They're going to make the connection with the behavior. They're going to know I was rambling and talking and talking in the meeting and not making any sense uh, because I was drunk. Okay, but I'm going to talk about them monopolizing the conversation and not getting to the point. Okay, they'll make that connection, and, and I basically respect that. Yes. Any one of 
any one of them. The way it tends to work is I will do the first contact, uh, or another volunteer will do the first contact, and then they'll meet in front of the elders um, to discuss it with the elders, or the elders can do that. Um, we're a relatively small group. Even, I mean, we we all know each other. Um, a lot of times it, it's just a matter of a friend coming up and saying, you know, is there a problem? You, you really didn't act like yourself, or, or you know, you were really disruptive tonight. You did a lot of talking, and you couldn't hear what was going on. So, in a way, I guess it's it's kind of like peer pressure. You know, I mean, we're not pressuring yeah. you to yeah. quit or or making them feel uncomfortable about coming, but they know that there's a lot of people there that could help. Therefore, they're they're more willing to let us know what's going on, and we are a very good support system. We don't condemn them for what they did, but we try to encourage them to behave better. Um, we have we have people that come from um, community um, foster care homes and things that um, the homes actually encourage them to come because it encourages better behavior, encourages them to take control and to be responsible for for outbursts and and you know be more under control of themselves just because it interferes with the rest of us. And they don't, you know, they, they want to be white, they want to be respected, and it's 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 an acceptance type thing. You know, they know that they're going to be accepted for who they are, therefore they try to be more socially, you know, correct. Well, they become who they are. And I think any time that you're acting out in any way, you're reacting or you're defending in some way, okay? But when you have a chance to just really be who you are and you're accepted for that, then your basic sense of self, which is inherently good and positive, I believe, comes out. So it's, it's setting an atmosphere where we're focusing on it, okay? we're letting go of that, of that other stuff. Uh, the example that Tina, Tina brought up, this young woman um, who was schizophrenic and was disrupting a lot of meetings, just in saying things that didn't fit at all with the situation and, and would both no when she meant yes and, and things like that. Uh, last week stood up and announced that uh, that she's got a job and is moving into independent living. She's having her own apartment. And okay, she's been in foster care all her life. So the sense of, of the that, that you belong somewhere and that you're valued and you're important, I mean you don't um, you don't you tend not to abuse that. Okay? There's a place where you can feel welcome and important then you'll tend to be your best self, your natural self. Decisions are made on Thursday night. The second one is um, only one person talks at a time, and the third one, I do remember them all. The third one is that we always keep peace, and that if there's arguing or fighting, we stop and do it. Okay, because the only three rules we have for the whole program, but we have lots of principles. Those are those depend on the situation, and you apply it, and it's always a process of improving that. It's not black and white. Okay. You don't fill out any applications when you come to the Heart Friends Cafe. We have introductions. You meet people. It's human first. Information later, if at all. Instead of threatening people, okay, if you don't go to work, we're going to cut you off. We trust that eventually they're going to want to improve themselves. And we've had people who come for a free meal for months on end, and then all of a sudden had one guy actually who became an elder, and for the first three months of the program, he just came for a free meal and walked out and left. No one ever said a word to him about it. You're welcome every time you come, and then the next thing I know, he had a job. And then he became an elder, and then he got another job on state and done. But there's no, there's no threats. We just trust that there's something in here and everyone that's going to move. So I could go to the Hard Times Cafe tomorrow night, and, and if I did not want to stay for the meeting, I could walk out. And no one would say a word to him. Someone might say, um, we appreciate it if you stay, or we'd like you to stay, uh, but there's no, pres or no pressure, and then you can come back and do that every week. No shoulds. 
and look at what people can do. Okay? It's a question of when you're ready to do something. Okay? No one's going to lay anything on you and say you have to do something. Instead of control from the top, which is how most organizations are structured, and particularly service organizations, control is from the ground. Patrons are at the top. And those decisions come from them. Instead of a rigid changing structure, it's a flexible changing structure. The structure evolves and changes and, and moves and bends uh, with the will and the need of the patrons. Instead of turf protection, we focus on what's most helpful. And that's something that's very crippling with a lot of service agencies is, is they get their own little niche and people try to hold on to that to, to save their jobs and their careers and things like that. Um, and the focus in terms of what's really helpful or what's really needed uh, can easily get lost in the process. Instead of the professional knowing best, the participant knows best. Any professional has to continue to learn from the participants to keep moving in this. Um, even if you had the best suggestion in the world yesterday, what you're saying today may not fit. And the bottom line is every person themselves knows what fits for them. Okay? Um, instead of a therapist, a mentor. Instead of case management, which is a real popular position, I call them not your case management sometimes, which is my experience with some of them. Um, someone managing your case, you focus on self-management. Instead of a supervisor, there's a coach. Instead of people having no input on the decision of the process, everyone has input and it's dependent on that. It's consensus. Instead of agency directed, it's needs and opportunity, or I'm sorry, it's self-directed. Instead of politics dictating a lot of decisions and how things happen, needs and opportunities dictate what happens and where it goes. Instead of there being a hierarchy, there's shared responsibility. Instead of auditors, we have advisors. Okay? And instead of accountability, we have responsibility. And those two in particular are something that is tightly structured into the human service delivery system where you have to, to prove what you're doing. And, and it's interesting, most of the agencies that I'm familiar with, primarily with the Department of Health, don't even look at the effectiveness of the services. You just have to meet the criteria that you're providing it in a certain way. And if you've got all your documentation done, that's what counts. Okay? It doesn't matter that you're actually being helpful. What matters is that you're appropriately documented. Okay? I worked for an agency for two years um, where we were doing evaluations on people and we didn't evaluate everybody the first year. And then I said, okay, well, let's start doing something. And I said, no, we have to evaluate them all over again because everyone with the loss and everybody had to evaluate every year. So all the staff time went into evaluations and nobody ever made any progress because we never had any time to do anything. We just spent the whole time evaluating. But the auditors came and said, oh, this is great, you guys do a nice job. Okay. Well, they were real pleased. Um, and accountability, okay? Where someone is always measuring and looking and checking up on what you're doing, okay? Instead of a sense of trust that people can be responsible for themselves when they're given that opportunity. It's just a question of, of matching that responsibility um, with where they're at and what they're ready to do. Any questions on the differences between a service perspective and an empowerment perspective? Do you guys have any comments about any of your experiences where you've gotten services and how it feels different to, to be working with empowerment?
and we take care of our responsibility in order to save another person from getting any deeper if you try to talk it out. That's what I've learned about that, that as well. What you have, question is, how can I handle that? Well, I took off with my saying about get out in the open, top it out with group, and then go from there. You develop a confidence, and that's part of, see, empowerment builds on itself. Because to the extent that someone has authority over their own life, they have, they, they get a growing sense of responsibility, and they're always improving. Um, my training is as a psychologist, and the interesting thing about psychology is you can get training all over the place. And the psychologists from Western will totally disagree with the psychologists from Central. Okay? I mean, they, won't, they won't be able to stay in the same room without arguing for very long. Okay? Um, the psychology that I have been interested in that I started with as an undergraduate was the psychology of healthy people. What makes people healthy? Okay, what does someone do who feels pretty good about themselves and is confident and is contributing to the community and has meaningful relationships? What are they doing that the rest of us aren't? When we're stressed out and have conflicts and difficulties and no confidence. What are we doing different than what these people are doing? And over the years, um, I found that I could summarize the difference between these two people, between what I would consider a healthy person and a person who's struggling, in one word. Okay? And that word is really the one word that sums up what the Hard Times Cafe is all about. As a matter of fact, I used to call out at some of the early meetings, what's one word that says what Hard Times Cafe is, and everybody would yell out, improvement. Okay? And that's the word. That, in my mind, is the definition of a healthy person, someone who is improving. Now, there's a couple interesting things about that word. First of all, it's a verb. It's nothing you attain, it's nothing you get, nothing you have. It's something you do. It's an ongoing process. And the real key is when improvement becomes a habit. And that every month you look back and say, I'm doing better than I was a month ago. And every year you look back and, and you see the changes and you see the development and you gain confidence that that's going to continue into the future. Okay? Um, it's, it's the basic thing. And so no matter where you are, if you're drunk or high, there's an expectation and a sense and an atmosphere that we're expecting improvement. Not a should, not a pressure, but just a trust, a sense of that. And it doesn't matter where you are. Anyone can improve. It doesn't matter what situation you're in at all. Um, as long as you're conscious, you can improve. Um, I worked with a young woman who was um, um, moderately mentally retired. She had an IQ of like 45. And uh, she came to the unit. I had the responsibility for, a, for a intensive care unit, for chronic uh, care unit. And um, she came there to die. She had uh, leukemia expected to die within a week or so, and they just didn't want to keep her in the hospital because it was more expensive. And this woman, she was 19 years old, um, had a, a gift for just being herself. She was, wherever she was, in every situation, she was present in that situation. And at the time, the, the place where I was working, the facility, was under a incredible amount of stress. They were understaffed, and the state had cut the budget, and there was no money for new staff. And the administration was making the staff work mandatory double shifts. And just about all the staff on this unit had kids. So here they were with no child care, all of a sudden, half an hour before they're to go home, to be told you gotta work an extra eight hours. And if you leave, you're gonna get fired. Okay. Um, so there was all kinds of stress and difficulty on the situation. And I think this young woman did more to deal with that than any $50,000 or $100,000 a year consultant could have done and spent a couple of months working with her. She was just herself. And when you were with her, you were you just had a sense that you were with a person. And, and she was just very simple and very basic. And I remember once that uh, uh, I used to keep her in my office a lot of the time, and, and I'd be doing paperwork. And one time she took all the paperwork from my office and just off my desk and threw it in the wastebasket and said, well, I'll, I'll talk to me. OK, not this paper, talk to me. Okay. And once she was uh, videotaping herself, um, I had a camera and videotape set up when she was getting into a Fonz routine. She just liked to be with the Fonz, you know, it was her favorite show. And this nurse came up to my uh, door and knocked and was just in a, in a just tizzy that everything was going wrong and real frustrated. And 
she looked at her sitting there getting into her father's routine and burst out laughing and uh, forgot what she was upset about. Okay. But just a sense of her presence and everyone pulled together, even with all the stress, she turned it around. She not only improved herself, but she improved everyone else there. One of the first jobs I had was working with uh, um, profoundly and, and severely retarded people. And I had a unit uh, where there were 26 uh, men, all who had a long history of violent <coughs> behavior. Um, and they were in a room that was maybe half again the size of this room right here. And the challenge was to figure out how to deal with this. And uh, the director of the facility, uh, Dr. Monroe, said, don't think about what you want to stop them doing. Think about what you want them to do. It's really talking about how to empower them. Okay. So what we did was figure out ways they could improve. We found out, um, I did some, some, spent some time with them and found out what they could do across the whole range, wherever I could think of. I got out some blocks, figured out how many blocks they could stick. I got some puzzles, figured out how complicated the puzzle they could work out. Got some balls, how hard I could throw a ball. Just whatever I could find and figure out what they could do, and I just put it on a list, and just a list for each activity. And got with the staff, and we worked out this program, and we only had an hour and a half, twice a day, to run the program, five days a week. And the rest of the time, they had to do all of the other things. Now, during that time, they were averaging 30 to 35 incidents a week where someone had to be held physically to stop them from hurting themselves or somebody else or breaking something. Okay. 30 to 35 times a week. We had one guy who got out and it cost $4,000 And they would set each other up. And there was very little furniture because it was all being broken and all around and stuff. Within three weeks of starting a program that just focused on improvement, so if they could stack two blocks, we teach them to stack three. If they could work a three piece puzzle, we give them a four piece puzzle. If they could throw a ball five feet, we teach them to throw it seven feet. And just focusing on improvement, nothing to do with their behavior, whether they were kicking or biting or breaking windows, nothing to do with that. Just focusing on improvement, we had an 83%.